Blog Talk Radio. Good evening and welcome to this edition of V Radio. Uh, in coming up in about 10 minutes, Peter Joseph, the founder of the Zeitgeist Movement, will be calling in to V Radio. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and I, I want to give a loud shout out to the people who just donated to uh, keep uh, V Radio on for another month. Um, one of them in particular, you know, gave me a really big donation. So um, I didn't get permission to mention them on the air, but you know who you are. And uh, you, all of you who did donate, obviously, are very, very much appreciated. I was very happy with that. Um, things are looking a little bleak there for a while. But in any case, um, today I have two panelists. Uh, we have a one-hour show. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Joseph would, was not going to be able to do a two-hour show. Uh, the call-in lines will be open at a certain point. Uh, I will be taking callers to talk to Mr. Joseph. I just have to ask all of you, please conduct yourselves as maturely and you know, on top of it as possible. Um, it's not very often that we can get Mr. Joseph on the show. I know you all have questions. Just please conduct yourself. If I bring you on the air, conduct yourself well. Um, now I'm going to uh, basically bring up my two panelists here. We have uh, Chibi who gives extremely eloquent introductions. Please introduce yourself, Chibi. Hello, I'm Chibi. <laughs> and also, um, from uh, f- formerly Truth or Fiction Radio, we have uh, Thunder. Hi, guys. Yeah, I'm actually thinking of changing the name again. For some reason, I can't seem to figure out what the best name would be. But uh, it's in hiatus right now, but I'm... Um, actually got an email from Acharya today that wants to come on and do a show about her new calendar. So Excellent. I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, setting that up here as soon as I get a hold of her on the phone and discuss the details. So I'm excited about that. So um, it's, it, it's not going to be in mothballs for too much longer. Well, that's good to hear because you guys leave entirely too much pressure on me if I'm the only radio show. <laughs> but, uh, we, um, it's funny. We actually talked about that just uh, in Vent just a little while ago and, mm-hmm. and something we'll talk about off air uh, mm-hmm. with you uh, concerning radio shows and stuff. So we'll, we'll have a discussion about that later. We had talked about actually at one point, and that's, I want to bring that up to everybody. Um, to those of you who listen to V Radio, um, or if this is your first show, make sure you visit v-radio.org. That's v-radio with a hyphen between v and radio.org. Um, in there, on the links page, I have a list of other radio shows. If you're doing a Venus Project or Zeitgeist Movement relevant radio show, I'll be happy to post a link to your show uh, with the details there. Um, and we've got, uh, once again, we've, only, we've got about eight minutes before Mr. Joseph calls in. Uh, I'm looking forward to today to seeing you know exactly what it is we'll be able to you know to basically converse with on him on about I'm, I'm trying to come up with uh, when I have questions that are the kinds of things that have to do with the organization of the Zeitgeist movement and the Venus Project and I know that there are a lot of questions about that and I want to give Mr. Joseph an opportunity to answer them I mean he answers uh, questions on his own radio radio show frequently obviously but he can't ever get to all of them so. Now is the time, folks. If you've had something that's been itching you in the back of your head all this time and, you know, you've, you've wanted to ask him, um, uh, the phone lines will be open. I'm going to go ahead and give the number now if you want to write it down. It is 347-945-7747. It looks like I have a call already. That may be Mr. Joseph. We'll see. Let's text it and check it out. Caller from one 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 one. You're on the be, air. That would be a blocked number. That would be me. Oh, <laughs> hello there, Mr. Joseph. It's hey, good to have you on. How you doing? Not too bad at all. I was expecting you a little later, but I'm glad you called in early because that way I don't just sit here and blab. Um, let me introduce you to a couple of people who I have on the call with us. Um, these are people who frequently are on V Radio. Um, okay. uh, this is Thunder. Go ahead and key up and introduce yourself to Mr. Joseph. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? It's Thunder. Hey, Thunder. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good to hear your voice. Usually I catch you great. at the uh, conferences, but uh, hopefully we can talk about things today. That'd be great. That'd Excellent. be wonderful. Uh, we also have Chidi, somebody who uh, made the long drive with me all the way to Florida to the Venus Project from Michigan. Wow. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself to Mr. Joseph Chidi. Hello, Peter. Hi. How are you? Well... Um, let me uh, 
Thanks for making that drive to Florida. It is quite a long drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was worth it. Um, it always is. Well, um, Peter, uh, today I, I told the, the listeners that at some point we'll open the, the call-in lines to questions and such. I guess um, there were a sure. couple that you know have been kind of burning in my head that I'd like to ask while we get things started. Um, but uh, the first of which would be, um, what is the what? Do you have any kind of time frame? I mean, nothing we're going to hold you to on the release of Zeitgeist Three. Well, the the published release is October, which I was actually trying to time with the Artivist Film Festival, which has been very kind to me over the years. Mainly, uh, you know, there's a lot of other film film festivals that would would really like to mainly just for mainly just for uh, audience reasons because they know the numbers would like to show the third film. But Artivist Film Festival is, you know, they've really they actually invited me in with the original film, which was out of nowhere. I mean, I could never have expected that from any relatively established film festival, and they've been extremely supportive. So their festivals each year are around October, November, so that was basically the hypothetical. That's why I chose that date, a little, about a year from now. But, you know, I'm, again, I'm trying to get it out earlier. I'm really trying. The uh, sooner the better is in the back of my mind, but I also want to make sure that it isn't rushed. And the last film was very rushed because I actually had the deadline set up for the uh, third art of this film festival, and I literally had to make it. It was they actually agreed to show the film without even really seeing it, which I thought was unbelievable. And, uh, you know, so to answer your question, October is the release date, but I'm going to try and get it out sooner, one way or another. Whether it goes to Artivist or not, I'm not quite sure, but I really like the people that run that organization, so I try to give them a, a hand to get a larger audience, which is exactly what has happened. And in turn, they give a little more credibility to the direction that we we're talking about because it is in, quote, Hollywood. It does get a lot of celebrity attention and press attention and has grown throughout mm -hmm. the years. So that's basically it. But if I can get it out earlier and I can get other means to distribute it as far as awareness, then, then I'll do that as well. Now, I just got an excellent question from one of my listeners. Um, uh, Peter Vand, I'm not even going to attempt to uh, say his last name. I get a lot of listeners from all over the world. Um, in, any case, in any case, he asked a question, actually, that I've been thinking about myself. Uh, people would like to know if you're ever going to release a high-quality audio version of the Zeitgeist music. Um, you did yeah. some really great musical work, and some of us would like to have it, even if it's free. <laughs> you know so. what? I, I get that a lot, and I, there's a number of reasons why it hasn't come out, mainly technical. But um, I think when the Zeitgeist Media Project comes up, I'm going to release all the music in Creative Commons through that, through that site. In fact, that's my intention. There's some complex Excellent. issues that I, that I don't want to go into and waste time on as to why that hasn't been released. But uh, it will be released, and I think it will be in conjun conjunction with the, the media site that's coming very soon. So, yes, it, it's coming. Excellent. Except that well, people use it. They don't use it for, you know, obviously they don't use it for profit reasons. I don't want to hear my music, you know, <laughs> being abused. And there's a signature to the music, too, that I've been hesitant, you know, because of the, the no another film coming out, there's always this, there's a, a synergy to those particular structures I use, and I kind of don't mm -hmm. want to give it away out of, a, out of a sense of identity, but at the same time, I know that's extremely artificial and extremely childish, so I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not considering it that way. I will release all the music, but, um, but I'm going to just make sure people that use it really use it within the context of zeitgeist, you know, because if I, you know, music uh, piracy goes, and as, as far as it's used in film, use in film, uh, someone could pick it up and use it for a completely commercial thing, and uh, there would be very little I could do about it if my terms aren't set very, very clearly, you know, with the Creative Commons. So oh, I understand all about that. It's the reason I, I have those conversations with Jacques constantly about his own hesitations about releasing certain things because he Precisely. got tired of people just grabbing them and making them into money. Right. Um, yeah, I can think of it already. As I already told you about the Spirit of the Age project, I know it would be really interesting to hear if we could ever play some of your music as a band. Um, oh, well, you, you, I don't know if you know, but the original production of Zeitgeist was a performance. It was a performance piece. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a percussionist, and basically, if you look at the original photography, which I have, of the original event, it was set up with two screens with a massive uh, multiple percussion set up in an, an, or an orchestral fashion. So basically, the whole thing is uh, born out of a musical concept, an early vaudevillian concept. And I've also had any, uh, an idea, which I, I guess I could mention, uh, for the Zeitgeist Media Project, which really just transcends the movement in a lot of ways. I'm going to let it have a life of its own once it starts. I have a feeling it's going to be very, very interesting, but I might do something called Zeitgeist Live, which mm -hmm. would happen in New York, and it could, it could serve a number of different functions. 
because I have a romantic association to music that I've had all of these years, I still like to, it's still enjoyable for me to incorporate those attributes, even though I'm very, very busy and have very little time to do much of uh, much playing anymore. But nevertheless, I keep it on the back burner, and I might actually come out with a project that is a multimedia project. And in, in basically what you're denoting, you know, playing some of the music uh, and bringing in new gestures, doing voiceovers with Jacques, there's a whole spectrum of things that could be done. Who knows, it could be actually a really great project, Zeitgeist Live in New York City, people could come, come any, any funds that are raised could go into, a, go into the donation for the Venus Project, things like that. So yeah, that would be excellent. Of, yeah, a lot of ideas like that to spread awareness. Because as you mentioned in the last show, it really, you can't, I was just actually working on my presentation for Iowa, and there's an, an analogy I'm going to use. You know, for the past, you know, I, God, for many, many hundreds of years we've known, actually it depends on who your sources are, but for a long time people have known that the world was round, right? They theorized that they could, they, could, they could figure that out. But it wasn't until the 1960s when they actually got the first photograph of the planet Earth. And just imagine the awe of those astronauts when they saw that little blue and green globe on you know, the Earthrise photograph, which I believe was the very first photograph ever sent back to the planet, to the public, above you know, the view of the Earth and space. Just the aesthetic of that, which I'm still in awe of. You know, there's no borders. It's just, it's just this single unit, this atmosphere of water powered by the sun, and it's an aesthetic that's so powerful, and that's really where art comes into play. Like you can tell people things about the Venus Project and resource-based economy and technological unemployment and statistics all day long, and it's not really going to sink in. Some of them, well, some of it will, but until they experience it, until they actually absorb right. it aesthetically, until they feel it, basically. You know, there's a big difference between watching somebody get their head blown off on television in Iraq and being that guy next to the guy that got his head blown off and is in shell shock for the rest of his life because he had to experience it Absolutely. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's where art comes into play. So anyway. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, my next question actually was about uh, the, the – well, first of all, actually, let me ask another one of the listener questions. Will there be a 1080p – I imagine that's something technical I don't know about – high-definition release of addendum? One zero eight. Oh, a ten eighty ten eighty progressive. Uh, I don't have it in ten eighty progressive. I didn't make that film at such high resolution, mainly because I had to use all of that archival footage. If you remember, there's all that black and white footage, which was very re low resolution. It was just basic SD. So in order to combat that, instead of doing some kind of crazy up resing of all the footage, I basically re down resed everything. And as far as general distribution through through DVD, and even even if you print a film, it still holds up very very well. So I don't have it at that size. I could I could up-res it a little bit more, but, um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. I, I think people are – right now we're really spoiled with, with resolutions in, in the uh, visual realm. I mean, I don't really personally yeah, don't care agree. if I'm seeing something on, in, on the Internet, which is at 720p. It's, you know, it's bigger, but it doesn't really make that much of a difference to me. If you have a good projector, you can project SD the size of, you know, the relevant size of a, of a widescreen – excuse me, in a widescreen format – and you, you, you're going to see it just fine, and even if it was 40 feet by 40 feet. It just comes down to your technology. So anyway, no, probably not. Mm -hmm. I might release. I am going to release both of them with better resolution outside of Google um, fairly soon onto Vimeo, most likely, because it seems to have a much higher integrity and a better bandwidth. So, right. uh, but other than that, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think you're going to see anything like that. I've always been uh, actually more of an audio person. I mean, I've got a really old TV that I had to buy special plugs for in order to use, but I you know, bought a stereo surround sound system because I cared more about my sound than I did my visual picture, so I understand where you're coming from. Um, right, sure. Yeah, now, um, what exactly, because I know a lot of people have wondered this, is the transition between the first movie and the second movie. How did you discover the Venus Project? Could you tell us that story? Yeah, I, I met um, William Gazeki. William Gazeki saw the first film, and we started an email relationship. I saw his films. I was originally familiar with his first film about uh, Waco, Texas, the um, you know the um, uh, the Waco, Texas debacle with the Branch Davidians. And he did a really right. good documentary on the fact that the government just lied through their teeth about virtually everything, and they they were shooting fire into the establishment anyway. The government essentially is very much responsible for a large degree of manslaughter in that particular event, but that shouldn't surprise us if we know anything about how... No, not at all. Operate. I've seen but, some really horrific stuff on that subject, but please, sure. go on. Sure. But so anyway, I saw I, saw, I was loosely familiar, and he, he, we were in contact, and he sent me, he sent me Future by Design, which was, which was relatively new. And I watched it, and I was blown away. I didn't really 
the thing about Seizure by Design is it didn't really go into the social stuff, and it wasn't until I, I praised William for his film, and he sent me, he took my email and he forwarded it to Roxanne. Roxanne emailed me out of the blue, which was very surprising, and Roxanne asked if I wanted to read the book as a follow-up, and I said, of course, so she sent me the book, and once I read the book, everything fell into place, because Future by Design is a, is a unique film, but it, it does not really touch the social aspect, and it wasn't until I read the book that I knew that this, this one individual needed, really needed to, to uh, get into the public arena for his social ideas, not, his, not a, just his clever, inventive ideas, because Jacques really is it's all about his social perspective. It has really little to do with his technological and scientific ingenuity, per se. Right. His worldview, which is so incredible in the way he puts it all together. So after that, I, I emailed back, and I was like, yeah, I'd love to come interview him, and, and I did. I came and interviewed him once, and I, uh, I think I saw them in, in total twice before the release of the film, and uh, that was basically it. When, people, when the first film came out, naturally, there was a... Well, you know, tremendous disparity of interpretation. But overall, people looked at the practical aspects and said, well, what do we do about these social problems? And uh, that was something I had been sh scratching my head with forever as well. I usually would take the, the, the typical route that most people did, you know, with political stuff, let's support Ron Paul, Dennis Kucinich, let's, let's uh, you know, fight the Federal Reserve and all the basic stuff that a lot of kids are doing now. It, but once I read that book and once I got to talk to Jacques and I've you know, I've seen him well over a dozen times since then. He completely turned me around to that next level, you know, which I think is what we're all trying to do with our audiences, to understand that the, well, the solutions that most people tend to propose are just, they're, they're not outside of the system. They're inside the system, therefore they really can't change the system. You have to step farther back to realize the entire system needs a complete overhaul. And that was, that was basically it. So the question was, what do we do? And I was very fortunate to, uh, to stumble upon Mr. Fresco, you know, as we all are, <laughs> as, as the world will probably be in time. Now, somebody actually asked this. I might even be able to answer it myself. But it was like, is there a director's cut of the first movie coming? Please add some sources from your organizations with credentials like architects and engineers or pilots for 9-11 Truth. I thought you had a final cut of the first movie. Is that correct? There are multiple cuts of the first movie. The reason I want to come out with a director's cut is mainly because of the, the nature of what we're doing now and the association of the first film. There are certain statements that were made in gesture that I, don't long, I, no, longer, I no longer agree with, mainly because of the interpretations that have been devised off of them. And what I mean by that is, is there's a, the interpretations that have come from that film have really been very different from, whatever I, I expect, from what I originally expected them to be. Some of them got it right, many of them didn't. And when it comes to actual um, world consciousness, when it comes to understanding what it is that's really the problem, which has to do with society itself and has to do with the way people think about society and hence the paradox in between the two, not to mention all the divisive no notions. Anyway, I don't want to go off on a tangent about that. Right. But the real issue comes down to the fact that the first film, I think, needs to be altered because it still gets more attention than all the other films because of the controversial nature of it, because of the sensationalism of it. I'm not going to change the first film in a way that's going to actually detract from the meaning of it and the point of it and the gesture of it, which, of course, is the most important element. But I want to rephrase a few things. And I expect that to be out... Um, oh, let's answer the question. Yes, I, I will point out arch architects for 9-11 Truth and all those, those growing institutions that have really done tremendously good work. In fact, that's the other as aspect, is I want to expand it. I'm going to expand part one with clarifications... For example, I'll throw this out there, the, you know, the crucifixions of these gods that were denoted in part one. The, um, actually, I'll, take, I'll, I'll give you an easier one, actually, it takes less explanation. The t December 25th birth date isn't really December 25th. It's a shorthand to express that because you know, back in ancient Egypt, there wasn't December 25th. What it is is the winter solstice. So the most correct way to adjust that is to describe all the gods as being, bo excuse me, being born around the winter solstice, because that's the symbology. Just small right. corrections like that that will really finally get rid of these people that don't understand the the difficulty in explaining this, the semantic problems you have, especially when you try to simplify things. It's not simple at all. Another example I can say really quickly is the crucifixions. These people weren't nailed to crosses. These gods were not. They were depicted in cruciform, and that's something that a lot of people just don't get at all. Jesus, theoretically, probably didn't exist, but we believe that, whatever. But he was depicted in cruciform, in, in, the, in, the, literal, in the literary description. 
just as all these other gods are depicted in the same capacity. And that's really what needs to be portrayed. It's a depiction. So if these are the things that have been blown out of proportion. No one researches them, and they don't understand that, uh, that we're being gestural when we describe. We're putting it in the context of Christianity. That was the framing, the context of the modern religious establishment. On the 9-11, there's so much great information about 9-11 that's been coming out. <coughs> I want to expand that section by probably five or ten minutes, um, mainly because there's other things that need to be updated and pointed out that add much more validity to this particular angle on that event. And as far okay. as the third section, I'm... Uh, I'm, well, I'm, I won't go into all of that, but nevertheless, to stop my ramblings, to stop my ramblings, I would say that I'm going to add uh, links. I'm going to add a lot more content and backup content, a bunch more references and a bunch more expansions. I've learned a lot from that film, and I think uh, it's going to be very interesting with the director's cut release. Um, it should be very refreshing, actually. Well, I don't think you were rambling. A lot of people had questions about the first film, sure. um, so I, I think that was all definitely great. Now, Thunder had a couple of questions you wanted to ask, so go ahead, Thunder. Sure. Hi, Peter. Yeah, you know, I know you've answered this, you know, ad nauseum, and I think that for whatever reason, there's certain groups of people, and and they come in waves that just, for whatever reason, don't get it. And these are the people that, you know, are so anxious to build that first city or let's get something going, let's start putting shovel to the dirt. Um, And I just... I don't understand why they don't get that the social transformation, the, the change in the value system has to happen first. And by putting you know, the shovel in the dirt and building a first city is really putting the cart before the horse. And I've heard you address this on more than one occasion, but I, I don't know why these people don't get it. Hey, I, I understand that. I think it's because it's, it's, it lacks some... Um it, it's more complex than just assuming you can build yourself out of the social construct, if you will. People just don't have that frame of reference. Very few people reflect on their, their values or, and their thoughts and their thought patterns and the, where they get their information, why they, be, why they behave the way they do. It really comes down to a psychological issue. Most people that you meet are very narrow. And I, mean that, I mean that in a general sense. They, don't, they have very little introspect, and they certainly don't think of themselves as products of the environment. The first thing that someone would have to realize is is the humbling perspective that. It... Hello, is you guys there? We're still here. Okay, sorry, my phone just went crazy for a section. Okay, sorry, I'm getting some uh, strange noise here. The first thing that people would have to realize is to humble themselves to understand they are in fact products of their environments. They're wa- they're walking culminations. So if someone outright rejects that, if they have an obsession with their free will, if they have an obsession with their novelty as though they are special, they are unique. Uh, we're all unique in individual ways. That's just the way things have worked out. Each one of us has capacities to do, to do things that others do not, and each one of us has limitations. And you can argue all day about the nature versus nurture argument. Regardless, the values are definitely based on, um, based on nurture, and I think that could be unequivocally um, proven, and I'm going to go into that in, in a tremendous detail in the new film. So if people don't have that frame of reference, what I just basically said, if they don't look at themselves that way, then they're going to have a very difficult time seeing how things can change. And again, it's just a very foreign notion. It's a very, very foreign notion. That's why Jacques, I think, has had so much difficulty throughout the years is because of that particular issue. And he said to me, actually, you know, that people come up to him all the time and they say, yeah, build it and I will come. I can't wait to live in your new city. (laughs) As though it would just be that easy. And the cultural, example right. I use, the cultural example I use the last radio show I think is good to restate is if you took you know, an indigenous culture of the Amazon and dropped them in the middle of New York City, they would not know what the hell to do. They would be absolutely out of place. They would feel foreign. They would feel threatened. They would feel confused. And if you did the same thing with our current culture and dropped them into you know, a nice Venus Project city or whatever you want to call it, a resource-based economy with freedom and access – uh, they would run around hoarding things. They would, they would feel paranoia. They'd feel exposed. They'd wonder where the police were. You know, they, they just would not have the cultural adaptation to, to be able to comprehend it. So that's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah it does. And, and I, you know, that's the thing. I get it, you know, and it's, sometimes it's hard to explain to some people that have this, this angst, you know, this urgency or Im- implied urgency that we've got to be doing something. It can't just be about you know, uh, spreading the, the word and, and making people aware. And, but that's really the, the thing that needs to happen first. As you said, yeah. um, w- you know, to throw people into a city, if it was built, 
they they wouldn't have a clue what to do. I I don't think. And that brings up my second point because we had somebody a very dogmatic person in Ventrilo last night that came in and, and raised a quite a stink about a couple things, and I won't go into the details, but it it, it falls right in line with my first question. Sure. And he was of the mind and very aggressively uh, uh, portrayed it in Vent, and Chidi can attest to this, that, uh, um, that I mean, there's I guess there's these rogue group of groups here and there, and, and they pop up and they come in waves of, of these people that, I don't know any other way to say it, they deify you, Peter, and think that, you know, that you're not taking on uh, the role of, what we don't like to call, you know, this leadership role. And, and we've had this explained to so many people that there's no leaders, that, that we're all leaders per se. Sure. But his, his comment was, you know, why is Peter not motivating? You know, why is he not stepping up and motivating these people to take this direction? And it's just, it, we tried to explain to him that it, it should not have to come from Peter. But why, why do you think that, you know, why are you waiting for Peter to jump in and motivate you when all this information that you should have in your head should be the motivational uh, aspect of why we're doing this in the first place? And it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't come from a person. Yeah, no, I agree. So what that, do you... What, I would say that, you know, there's a, there's a lack of confidence out there, especially when it comes to complex ideas like this, where people would prefer to follow somebody than to make their own decisions. And as you know, my rhetoric has always been constant with, um, you know, people email me and they say, well, maybe we should do this, this, and this. And I say, great, we'll go do it. You know, it, it's not that they have to get directives from me. I get a little frustrated because people email me perpetually. And sometimes it's, it's out of innocence, like the chapters, and they ask me these questions that they really shouldn't be asking, things that are so obvious. You know, they'll, they'll send me something that's just absolutely obvious that does not need any form of, quote, approval from me. Uh, they should just be out doing it. I think the direction is self-evident enough. As far as myself, I'm trying to be motivating them in the best way I can, but I refuse to, to take that role, just as Jacques has said. He doesn't want anybody to follow him. Once you get into that mindset, it just becomes super destructive. I'm, I'm a very introspective individual. For me to go out and talk to people is actually very foreign to my, uh, to my upbringing, because I've had to very much learn how to, to speak and to attempt to communicate these ideas and it's very new to me, and I'm actually really not that comfortable with it. I do my best to try and talk and be, quote, motivating, but I, I, as you point out, the real issue is people being independent. And once you do that, you start to create a holographic type of movement, something that's really never been done before. You get people on the same wavelength, so to speak, that are moving in, in a common direction. And as far as I'm concerned, until humanity itself wakes up and realizes the commonalities, realizes the obvious necessity of food and all the basic attributes of life, realizes the importance of a scientific systems approach to the management, acquisition, and surveying of resources, things that could, quote, eliminate poverty um, as, a, as a simplistic example. That's what I like to use with people. I say, well, the first thing we want to do is eliminate poverty, and their ears go up. And they say, well, how do you eliminate poverty? Obviously, it's much more than just eliminate poverty, but I like to use that example because you could eliminate poverty tomorrow. If you understood the foundation of it, you apply the systems approach to society. So it's very tangible. So you know, back to my original point, I hope everyone out there listening knows that we have a tremendous amount of information on the site. Jacques has tons of essays. He has so much work over the course of these, the years. In fact, the whole archives of his. If you want inspiration, go to the archives of the Venus Project and look at everything that Jacques has done. And really just kind of look at yourself as a mirror. Look at, feel inspired by that, where you can go out and you want to invent and you want to create and you want to be, make something that's socially viable, something that actually has a positive effect on, and to change things for the better. I think being motivated and inspired by people is important. Jacques certainly, certainly does that, I think, for a lot of people. But as you point out, it becomes very distorted once um, a leadership role has been assumed. And as far as I'm concerned, to sum this up, the ideas we talk about really aren't that complex. The biggest thing that comes down, and it comes back to your first point, and when you, when you get someone that disagrees with this direction, they always come down to the same thing. They throw out the terms human nature. That's the central argument. That is what I hear every day. There's a, somebody sent a forum post of some, some renowned thinker, and at the very end of this forum post, it's gonna, I'll, I'll answer the question. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, I'll answer it tomorrow. 
And the only defense he could come up with was, well, it's against human nature because humans want to cover, cover each other and they, they want to beat each other. And it, it, these people don't know what they're talking about. Are they qualified to define something as human nature? I don't think they are. None of them are. So where's the science behind that? So everyone out there listening again, if someone comes at, back at you with this human nature bullshit, you got to just stop them in their tracks and make because they say it like like they they repeat. They're repeaters. Everyone just repeats things. That's that's an it's, unfortunate. Yeah, flaw. it's a great cop out. The human yes. nature argument is just a huge cop out. It's the excuse for any problem that society has. Yes. And it it's so ridiculous because they don't they don't spend any time trying to really define what that is. They just kind of throw their hands up in the air and it's their excuse not to be responsible for the the state of humanity. Um, now, did yeah. you have something, Chibi? Well, I, I something just a personal example that I was that I've been using after it occurred to me, like just something very simple, extremely simple, actually, maybe too simple. That you know, what are the main things that if you say, well, what is human nature? Just you don't even have to bring up the Venus Project. It's just, if you were to ask some random person, what do you think of the basic instincts or whatever of, of not just mankind, but just creatures in general, and it's what, survival, uh, reproduction, uh, to eat, obviously, sustain yourself, that's part of survival, and yet you have people that will fast, you have people that will abstain, and you have people that will kill themselves. Maybe right. kind of a weird example, but it's true that's good. that, I mean, well, how do you, how does that happen? If that's our instinct, well, obviously, if there is such a thing as an instinct and a human nature, well, obviously, it doesn't mean that much, because uh, given the circumstances somebody might go against it. And to well, me, that seems very simple and, and yet obvious. Yes, and I would add to that that the malleability of the human being is what's so incredible. If people say, well, evolution sets in stone, you know, certain patterns and humans being the organisms that they are, they will adhere to these patterns in an instinctual manner. And while there are some instinctual attributes that can be found in human and non-human primates, for example, most, um, most non-human primates will instinctually, if you want to use that word, we'll just use it for arbitrary reasons, they leave their packs at a certain age, and they go off to find, males do, male and non-human primates do this, they go off to find um, another group to live in. Why? Because they don't want to breed with their family. There's an, there's an evolutionary aspect to not breeding with your own kind, because as we know very thoroughly, that inbreeding causes tremendous problems. However, humans still inbreed, don't they? <laughs> in fact, humans inbreed probably more than any other primate. Why? Because we have a tremendous amount of flexibility, it seems. We have a consciousness, if you will, and, and it just goes to show that out of, there's something extremely malleable about the person. Even though we might have finite attributes, we do things of, in, all, in every spectrum. We have people having sex with dead people. We have things that uh, George Carlin, for example, has a great skit he does where he, he defines uh, all these bizarre things that humans do that no other organism does. And I always thought it was actually a, a very funny notion. And what it proves to me is that humans are ridiculously malleable and it really just comes down to the environment and the conditioning i think that i think there's there are limits uh to the ways that people think there are obvious neurological chemical hormonal things that go on that have have uh, exaggerate tendencies if you have a great deal of testosterone in your system it doesn't make you more aggressive it will magnify aggression and this is a, a tip a, it's actually a fairly recent biological discovery. It's always been thought that genetics and uh, hormonal releases, genetically defined hormonal releases, had a, just an innate element. And they would, if you had a certain amount of this, then you had a higher propensity for this. But it actually is the other way around. If you have a certain amount of this, it will simply magnify something that, that triggers it. So if you're violent behavior, type A personalities, these are people that have certain chemical adaptations that, if triggered, they will react, they, excuse me, they will fit the profile. But people can go their whole lives without having the triggers. Two twins, for example, can be born with the exact identical twins, the exact code, and one will have a gene for schizophrenia, and the other one will have the same gene, but it's a 50% chance that either one of them will get the actual disease. So the environment has a critical role, and that's actually a very pivotal example of the one I just used because... Um, because you know the, the twin theory is one of the biggest things that's a fallback, and the twin theory I feel is easily debunkable once you get into it, but uh, we won't go into all of that. Right. Um, I would just to get some more questions here from the listeners. Um, Azzy from Zeitgeist Ireland said, "Have you ever considered uh, proofreading the information about 9/11? Do you acknowledge that any any of it may have been inaccurate?" There are certain things that have been in, in high debate. 
and I've heard a lot of contested information. There's maybe about, uh, out, of, out of the 50 points that are made, there's probably about three or four that I would take out. Sure, because information changes, and there's some things that have been reported in the media, which is used as a source, is later disproven. But the reports in the media are all we have to go by at that particular point in time. You know, there's some passport issues that have been mixed around. There's, there's lots of things in there, but as far as the holistic communication, as far as the, the, most, the most important points and the train of thought, I, w I would say that I'm very, very happy with the way that, that uh, section has worked out. And that's another reason why the Director's Cup will be what it is. I will, I will remove all those attributes that are in debate, and I will, well, those that are in obvious debate, those that have basically been proven wrong. There are a few small things. I don't want to go into them. I really consider them minor, or I would, I would point them out. And I'm going to expand right. the section so they would, so we pick up on all the good information, such as Sybil Edmonds and all the uh, important information that's come out, the internal stuff. On that note, let me say that the, the issue of 9-11 really isn't the physical evidence to me. It isn't the towers. It isn't, um, it isn't any of that. It's the actual government's, the, what the government has done. It's what the government had in preparation with the war games. It's everything that the government did before and after this event, how it was capital, capitalized on, the CIA connections to the insider trading. These are the important attributes. You know, you can, you can watch uh, John F. Kennedy's head being blown back into the left over and over again and say, you know what, it looks like his head being shot from the front, yet what good has that evidence done us? Obviously nothing. It hasn't done any good. Right. People still, uh, consensus evidently still says he was shot from the back when it's obvious the video evidence shows otherwise. So I don't bank on the video evidence anymore. People, again, it's, uh, it's following the data trail is my biggest interest in that subject. I don't really think about that subject much anymore because there's lots of other people doing it, but uh, nevertheless. So to answer right. Azzy's question, yes, there's, there's some problems with it, and they will be corrected, but none of those problems uh, really hinder the overall, uh, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> really hinder the overall um, expression and uh, conclusions. Okay. I think I hear Chibi queuing up. Go ahead, Chibi. Oh, well, I just wanted to add to that something or sort of ask a question as well because uh, I remember talking to Jacques about this as well. Um, personally, I didn't feel attached to the 9-11 issue. Uh, when I first saw the first Zeitgeist film, it was like, I'm, it was after I'd seen Loose Change and other videos along that line. And I'm still, at this point, not really at a firm conclusion. I'm kind of on the fence. But it, it's kind of irrelevant at this point because I feel like even if it was happened the way it said they said it happened like you said they capitalized on it whatever it doesn't really change um what the venus project proposes uh, none of that has doesn't it doesn't rely on that just like jfk like you brought up jfk well what if tomorrow we find out jfk was killed by george bush or something i mean ridiculous as it may be i mean what would it really change nothing it, it wouldn't change anything what we're proposed no it wouldn't no the only thing that the right. only reason it i bring up the Sure. The only reason I bring that, those issues up is further nails in the coffin of the system. The, right. We have to show the problems, but we have to also show the solution. And I think uh, it's, it's a little negligent, in my mind, to ignore what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, because if people aren't paying attention to the continual frauds, the, just, the, just the perpetual state of corruption that, that the, all the governments of the world operate in, if they can't see that, then we're never going to find any form of change. So I, on that level, I think it's advantageous to, even if you don't believe in, in the government involvement in 9-11, uh, if you see the problems in and of themselves, you point out the other attributes that happened, such as the fact that FEMA opened up, opened up Wall Street three days after, at, on, upon Wall Street's, excuse me, upon, the Washington, upon Washington's recommendation, and now you still have people dying from ingesting all of these silicone computer chip uh, asbestos chemicals, I mean, even that in and of itself, the public isn't aware of that. and has nothing to do with the, quote, conspiracy. Just the obvious negligence, obvious, just for money. No, I, the yeah, public I agree. Understand Not all to mention that. going into Iraq, that even, well, yeah, if, even if 9-11 was entirely al-Qaeda, there was no reason to go to Iraq. Yeah, they were all from Saudi Arabia, right. our, our buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I've always found that funny that all the hijackers were allegedly Saudi Arabian, um, yet for some reason we were, you know, invading a bunch of other countries that were not Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but, um, we're, still, we're still in Afghanistan. Same trigger for Afghanistan. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And I, I wouldn't either. And I, I'm, I just, I don't really know what to say when it comes to 9-11. I, I believe there was government involvement. I just don't know how far it goes to what level. And it's just one of those things that I just decide to let lie. But I notice a lot of people have an obsession about it. Um, right. 
that I think is damaging in a way. Like some people who have been on Ventrilo, for example, will go on and on about that. And it's like, sure. well, it, like they go out and just everybody they meet in the street, 9-11, the inside job, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And at some point down the road, they might mention the Venus Project. It's like, well, I don't think that should be our focus per se. I think it's something that's interesting that everyone should look at for themselves and, and come to some sort of conclusion eventually on if they can. But right. You know, I've, I've said that actually myself was just that it, it comes down to the fact that, you know, you know, if the conspiracy theorists are right, then the Venus Project will still cure all of their problems anyway. False flag terrorism will go away. You know, all of the things that they're so concerned about will go away. But you can't shove 9-11 in everybody's faces because some people don't want to hear about it. But those people may be persuaded to check out the resource-based economy. And that's why it's, it's sure. really focused. Well, if they understand what we're talking about, we're not talking about the problem is the association. I'm well aware of that. This fringe, you know, cultish Alex Jones, New World Order shit that has unfortunately permeated people that research government corruption, thinking that it is basically redefining what everything might mean. I mean, that's and then really sell the issue. their information for 1995. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, that know, was actually one of my favorite parts of that particular interview was when you kind of, I mean, you didn't do it on purpose, I don't think, but you kind of nailed him when you pointed out, like, you know, to Alex Jones, like, how much he charges for his videos, and then he asked you how much you charged as if that was going to get him anywhere, and you pointed out that you charged, like, five bucks or downloaded for free. Yeah. Um, we yeah. actually have a caller, a uh, caller at 480 area code. You are on the air. Yeah, hi. Um, this is Paradigm from the forum and the vet. I was just going to real quick mention... About the whole uh, genetics thing, there's actually a book that's written by somebody with the uh, last name Joseph as well, although I know that's not your last name, but it's called The Gene Illusion. It's pretty interesting. It goes into the whole idea of uh, there's no real veracity to the, to the notion that you know, the identical twins are going to have the same fate. And actually, there's a lot of uh, evidence lately that even, the, even though they have the same genes at birth, they're not the same um, later on in life. So that's yeah. kind of interesting. And I, I also want to know what you think about Alan Watts. Uh, which, which Alan Watt? There's a few of them out there. You mean the philosopher? Yeah, not the recent guy. That's I'm not interested in him, but the, the philosopher that's dead. You know, honestly, uh, people have mentioned Alan Watt to me a few times. I haven't really had a chance to, to research a lot of his stuff. I've seen some quotes by him, and, and what I have seen, actually, I did appreciate, but I really can't comment on it because I haven't had a chance to uh, research his work. Do you have any of his books? Would you? What would you recommend? Well, most of the stuff that I've actually seen is just his, uh, his radio addresses that he gave. He used to have, like, a, a radio show. Um, okay. In South Lido, California, or whatever. But I mean, I, I have a couple of his books, but his his oration is actually what's uh, what's attractive to me. Uh, he's just a general philosopher type, though. He doesn't have any like concrete stuff, but he's just really interesting to listen to. There's a okay. video on YouTube that has Alan Watts and the Zeitgeist Movement uh, as a okay. title, and that's pretty interesting too. Oh, I'll check that out then. Thank you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, now, there was another question. Somebody asked, are you going to be using anything from the media project in your upcoming movie? Oh, good question. I haven't thought about that because the media project is not in full operation yet, though the web designer is working on uploading it, attributes of it right now. Luckily, it's been a long time. Um, there was a project that uh, an individual inspired me. Um, an individual named Luke, is, uh, who I met in the UK, is traveling in internationally right now. And he had an idea, he emailed me, about having video and photographs of various people, say in India or Africa, hold signs that said the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement or something along the lines of that, in, in, in an expression of unity. So the, the, the idea was to have you know, many, many countries with different nationalities, indigenous cultures, holding up these signs or talking about the Venus Project. And uh, this is just in the back of my mind. I probably shouldn't bring it up because... But nevertheless, I think what I'm going to do when the media project starts is I'm going, to, I'm going to solicit for this. Anybody out there in all the countries that are currently signed up to send a photograph or send some media of them expressing this direction in some way, just because of, as a, just a great poetic element, and then that would be used in the credit sequence of the third film, just to, just to really bring in this unifying attribute that there really are people all over the world that see in the same, in the same way. But uh, beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the, you know, the UK design project, I'm hoping that they get some work out that I might be able to incorporate. It really just comes down to what people start doing with the, with the site. If I see some great, you know, some great gestures, some great music, who knows? I, I'm, I'm certainly open to anything. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah. uh, well, uh, 
thank you very much for being on tonight. I know a lot of people in the chat room are wishing you could have stuck around longer. I understand you're busy. Um, but with any luck, maybe I'll be able to get you on at another time, too. I just wanted oh, to get sure. that out of the way before any further questions come up. Um, yeah, no looks like actually I might be getting pinged with another one right now. Um, we have about 15 further minutes. Uh, once again, I'm going to ask people in the chat room if anybody would like to ask questions. Now is the time. I'm going to give out the phone number again. It is 347-945-7747. That's 347-945-7747. I want to thank Paradigm for calling in. I don't know why people always chicken out, but <laughs> it's like, come on, guys. You have all kinds of questions for this man when, you know, when, when you, you know, it's not like he's going to bite you or anything. I remember that, actually. <laughs> Go ahead, Thunder. I thought your phone lines would be flooded. I mean, I, I assume they would be. I guess that's the way it is. Um, We've got a uh, lot of listeners. Go ahead, Thunder. Uh, Peter, you know, I, uh, you mentioned something at the international meeting about uh, being in Los Angeles for the screening of, of the third movie. Right. And uh, do you have uh, any solid um, uh, dates when that's going to happen? Because I know there are a lot of people, uh, at least in the Southern California part of the California chapter, that really want to organize a, a, a huge event um, yes. and we're very anxious to obviously to meet you in person when you come to that. Do you, do you know for sure when you're going to be here? I don't know for sure. In fact, I probably shouldn't have, have speculated on the film festival as of yet, but I do have a decent confidence that, that they will show a unique interest. Uh, the, the addendum was the most popular film of the entire festival last, last year and drew the largest audience. And I'm good friends with the people that run the organization. So basically, if you were to find out when their festival is next year, it would be around that time. But again, I can't say anything set in stone. I have been planning to come okay. to Los Angeles anyway, and there might be a possibility, depending on how things go over the course of the next year, for me to come and maybe meet with, uh, meet with the chapters in that area even beforehand. In fact, I've been intending to do that. I have a lot of friends in Los Angeles. I might be doing some things related to the new film, actually, uh, in, in Los Angeles because those are where particular people are that I need to interface with. So if I do do that, I'll definitely get in touch with you, Thunder, and uh, we, can, we can set something up. But otherwise, it would be contingent upon the Artivist Film Festival, which usually happens around October or November. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, there's also a, a small group of us, and I say us because I'm involved as well, that are working feverishly to find a, uh, you know, a foot in the door to the real time with Bill Marshall and to try to get you and or jock on there. So we're yeah. in the works of doing that as well. I, I hope you're open to that. Oh, by all means. I, I think I think Mar would identify with uh, Zeitgeist Part 1. I have an odd feeling he's seen that one. But uh, nevertheless, you know, he he's obviously would have a... He'd have to get through the, the... You know, there's other things that he'd have to get through. And we have, you know, as far as controversial issues, I know he's a very much against the 9-11 truth thing and I, whatever you can say about that. So the only opposition I would see is him finding some type of problem or association with me coming on. As far as Jacques, I think he'd have an open open air to do so. But by all means, if right. I could actually get on that individual show, I, I think I could have a very, very good effect. Um, I agree. Given, given the things they talk about on that show, which are completely surface-oriented, it'd be very easy to break what their general conversations are down, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, speaking of being on shows, um, how is the uh, progress going with you being invited to TED Talks? I haven't heard back from them. I submitted all that information. Evidently, they haven't decided anything yet. Um, the information was submitted. My source, excuse me, my um, the individual that provided a recommendation did get feedback from them, a thank you, uh, but it was a form submission through the Internet site. Uh, evidently, they will tell everybody who submitted whether they became a fellow or not. So I haven't heard anything back, and I haven't seen anything posted. So we'll find out. No idea. Okay. I, I would um, hope so. I mean, I've, I looked at a lot of their other fellows uh, in other countries. The, they have other specific programs, and it would be very disappointing to me if if they didn't take this this particular issue on, because there's an, there really is a lot of interest for it, and I I think that's really what it should come down come down to. And obviously, we're talking about science and technology uh, in the most broadly applied way, socially. So I would hope that they have the social concern to do so. But we'll find out. I hear the distinct white noise of Chibi keying up again. I want to ask one more question before I put him on again, though. Um, any uh, progress with Hugo Chavez? I know you were looking into that. That was all. That well, that's something that. Uh, 
That is something that I probably should never have brought up because you never really know when you talk to particular individuals what their what their disposition is. Essentially, there was an individual at the consulate in Chicago, the uh, Venezuelan consulate, and we're still in touch with him. He is on vacation right now, and the essential intent is to try and get a package in front of in front of Mr. Chavez, or just anything, just basically anything, to get in contact with anyone in his cabinet to get projects oriented. No, we had a we had a talk with him, and uh, the general consensus was he wasn't in, entirely clear on the direction. He was very motivated. He was very interested. The uh, the diplomat consulate guy that we spoke with, I don't want to give out his name, but nevertheless, uh, it's one of those things I don't really bank on. But uh, we're going to continue doing our best. Chavez is a is a, in a very unique position in Latin America with the essentially the revolution that's been happening in Latin America, and as I think I mentioned to somebody else. Well, regardless, uh, Latin America, I think, is a very ideal place for this type of ideology to take hold because of the general instability, because of the high poverty rates, because of the interest for change, and, of course, the environment would be highly conducive to the first, the first uh, test city. So I'm, I'm very interested in Latin and South America. Um, I actually have one more thing before I want to bring Chibi on. It just occurred to me. Uh, we've been talking about the possibility of putting together a project wherein we kind of uh, create a one source where everybody can go for uh, their you know, to put their blog talk information for the various shows that are relevant. Is there any chance that you know, this might be something that the Zeitgeist you know, website might be usable for, just to have links to all of these shows for the people who are putting in the time to oh, help well, you guys express these ideas? Actually, uh, one thing that's been lagging is the audio-video page that's on the site. Uh, there's been formatting problems with that, and I. <laughs> I've got to I've got to delegate that to, uh, to somebody really quickly just to get it done, but mainly to bring up to the on the page bring up the best audio video that we have out there. And I think all the radio shows should be listed in general, by all means. And the Zeitgeist Media Project could have a section for that as well. So uh, the Media Project is really going to be the hub for uh, any form of communication that we can come up with. Uh, I hope it's going to be very robust, and I think it will be. I think it will be. So yes. Excellent. Uh, go ahead, Chibi. Um, well, just to that point, it'd be pretty easy to just add some widgets. But um, I had a question about the next movie, and I was wondering, it, it, I liked the orientation guide. I, I mean, everybody's a little different in that sense, their, their upbringing, their background, whatever. How, what they respond to is a little different. Um, some people who respond more to just raw data, um, and I'm one of those people, I, I kind of wonder if the next film is going to have a little more of that kind of feel to it. Um, I know Addendum, I... I really enjoyed, uh, obviously introduced me to Jock and, and whatnot, but, um, you know, like the whole section on John Perkins, it was great, and yet there wasn't, after reading his book, I realized that a lot of it is substantiated, and yet it's hard to cover in two hours a lot of stuff, but I just kind of wondered if there was going to be a little more um, statistics and data offered, things that you can go back check the numbers on and things like that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Chris Martinson, the crash course, he's not a proponent of what we do, but it was such a great, uh, it's more of a lecture, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if not, I would suggest you check it out. It's really great. And it, I, I know who he is, um, yes. Uh, people have been recommending <clears throat> him to me. Uh, as far as your point on statistics, Addendum was a, a huge overview film. I mean, that film was actually cut down from, I think, about two hours and 45 minutes because it was just insane. Still there? Uh, sounds like his call accidentally disconnected. I'm sure he'll call back here in just a second. Yeah, I thought I heard a disconnect as well. Thanks again, once again, everybody, for tuning in. Unfortunately, we're down to like the last six minutes of the show. I'm hoping to be able to get a, you know, the answer to the question in, and, and depending on how long it takes Peter to realize that he disconnected. I know sometimes when I'm talking, I don't realize it right away either. Um, but uh, once again, everybody, thank you for tuning in to V Radio. Please visit v-radio.org. That's v-radio.org. And we're going to bring Mr. Joseph back on the air. Hello, Peter. Is that you? Hey, Neil. Sorry about that. That's okay. Well, the good news is you sound louder this time. <laughs> Do I? I have multiple phones here. I was wondering why my phone was making so much noise. That was because the battery was dying. I usually don't use that phone. Sorry about that. That's the problem. Uh, Go ahead and continue my... with what you were saying. Right. Um, the statistical stuff that is going to be in the new film will be very, very, oh, excuse me, it'll be very important to prove the attributes that we talked about. Going into part three of Addendum, there's a bunch of stuff that's rattled off about technological unemployment, about the capacity of technology in general. Um, the systems approach concept 
And what I'm going to do in the whole point of the new film is essentially to break down the nuts and bolts through independent academic interviews. I will have a lot of people talking in this film. They won't necessarily be, be in agreement with the direction, but I really don't care because it's an attribute, it's an attribute establishment. In other words, I want people that uh, have expertise in robotics, people that have expertise in various fields that would be relevant to what we discuss, and I want them to, do, to explain in plain, ter in plain terms uh, the capacity of their particular medium. And I, from the research that I've done, it should be very, very effective. So back to the, uh, to summarize, I would say that the new film is essentially going to be an expansion of part three of Zeitgeist Addendum with statistics and interviews and academic support, which I think is what we really right. need at this point. Because yeah, that too sounds many, great. But... Yeah, too many people just don't want to do the research and they like I have a huge section on the human nature argument because that's, in a lot of ways, that's the most critical. As I mentioned a long time ago, I was just going to do the whole film essentially on that, but I decided that it needs to be more broad. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the transition. I'm going to do a lot of time on the most complex subjects as best I can to really get rid of this because I've had such a great amount of questions. As you know, I, I get every question you can imagine. I've been able to digest so much, uh, so much confusion that uh, I have a good sense of what needs to be explained, so the, so the audience walks out with a very, very clear understanding. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, another question from the chat room. Apparently this one came from Ventrilo. Uh, okay, my question would be, when the Venus Project is put in place, would there exist some sort of trends or general directions humanity will live under? Trends or general directions? Well, I guess what they essentially they're describing a cultural aspect, right? That's why yeah, I assume, so assume, like. assume from that question. Well, I mean, there's going to be patterns that are be, will be developed as far as conduct. You know, with the monetary system removed, and we're talking. Did, I'm sorry. Did they say during the transition or after the transition? After. After yeah. So after the transition, assuming. I mean, obviously, it's always a transition. I hope everyone understands that. When Jacques says during the transition, it, he, he's saying that in a gesture. There's no final point with this. The abolition of the monetary system would be probably the biggest step once that, once that is gone. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, the value systems have to come in accord with uh, the sharing of elements. There's no more property. So uh, there's a whole new systems approach to people getting access to what they need. If you don't, for example, in New York City, we have this thing called the zip car. And it's essentially they leave these cars around. You go on your computer and you can find one near you and you just go get it and you can use it for a little while and then you drop it back off in a nearby place. Well, in time, you know, why would you need to pay for something like that? And in time, even farther out, you would be able to use automation for that. And you could, you could do that through satellite tracking. The car will be brought to you through computer technology, through satellite tracking technology. Those attributes, that's a huge, huge, huge question that person just asked me because that, that basically is – is everything that we were talking about as far as what life would be like. So I can't go into complete detail. But right. you know, the sharing, the, the worldview that the resources of the planet are common heritage and what that means when it comes to your everyday life, what that means when it comes to your, your uh, sense of connectivity to, to society. Then obviously there's the whole massive topic, which I'm going to go into in detail in the Iowa presentation about how decisions are made. That's another extremely boring question that I get over and over again is, who makes yeah. the decisions? Who makes the decisions? They don't understand Those are the people that, that are looking for government. They're looking for the, the oppressive government that's going to get them. That's why they ask that question. It's a loaded question that libertarians and the anarchists are going to ask you specifically because they want to hear how, well, because you sound like a socialist, this must be fascism in the making. So where's that fascism? Here it is. Who's making these decisions? <laughs> that's what this is about. Oh, I know, but the funny thing is, is that the very question is faulty because no one makes decisions in any capacity. There's a methodology that makes decisions. So, you, right. so if anybody out there is listening, that anyone asks them that question about the movement, you just stop them in their tracks and say no one makes the decisions. There's a method used where people follow that method to make the decisions, and very loosely speaking, it's a scientific method. But in the presentation, I'm going to show how the actual application of decision-making process um, is done as I see it, and as I'm going to bounce this, of course, off of Jacques. There's a great deal of variable with these subjects, but um, you know, I'm going to really clarify that because um, that's another one that I'm really getting tired of hearing about. So, mm -hmm. anyway. Now, I only have a couple more things to ask you. Do you mind staying on just a little longer? No, that's fine. I can go a few more minutes. 
Okay, good. Um, just because there's somebody who's been insistently re-asking this question. And uh, basically, what do you think about the idea of Zeitgeist, uh, Zeitgeist Movement Chapters promoting regional debt-free, interest-free currencies as a first step for people to become independent from the monetary system? I guess the question is, how do you even possibly assume that would work? I mean, the chapters could pass around fake money that doesn't have any debt, you know, but how are you going to actually do anything with that? in the actual society, in the towns that people live in. I think the well, real... Well, give a clarification, actually. Let me go ahead and add that. It says, to clarify about my question, such government independent currencies are in active use all over Germany. They are issued mostly digitally by the people. They include a fixed basic income, and they're not illegal. Yeah, well, that, that goes back to early American stuff as well. But there's still, there's still an element of regulation. I'd have to look into what they're talking about. I don't see how that would, that might be a form of patchwork in the meantime. I, I do think that the elimination of interest, as a general example, um, would be a very positive thing to do in our current society, and it would alleviate tremendous amounts of debt. But as far as going through the length of trying to establish a new currency for regions in the United States or anywhere in the world, uh, especially within the movement, I, I, I see that as a massive, massive task that would be very, very difficult. Oops, hold on one second. <laughs> I guess your show just ended. Yeah, yeah it did, but it's, we're still on. And it'll be in the archive. Um, oh, good. Okay. Each time you go Sorry. over, it goes on to the archive. I, I knew that was going to happen. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, go ahead and finish what you were saying, and then I'll get the last couple items, and then we'll go. So while I'm open to the suggestion, especially in the transitional sense, it would take a great deal more thought to see if it's really worth worth going going through with. I mean, I, honestly, if I, if I was to choose a transitional method, it would be a time bank more than a revision of currency, which would incorporate a rejection of the system. At a time bank, if you don't know out there, it's in New York there's one that's actually growing quite quickly, and I've been in contact with some of the people trying to think of some form of incorporation. Basically, a time bank is an exchange of time, and it's going, it goes into a computerized system. People have a, there's a method where people document services they, they provide for each other, and it goes into a computerized system, which gives people, I guess, what you'd call credits. And it's actually working fairly cleanly with the friends of mine that actually do it. You know, someone, someone will mow your lawn if you give them piano lessons. You know, there's a, it's of course, there's a gray area as far as what value is equal to what value, but the fact that people are doing this at all is amazing. And when you do that, you're destroying the market <laughs> because the circulation is stopping. I think that's actually a very, uh, a very promising concept.